Hi everyone and welcome to a new video on the CBI channel. In this tutorial series, we're creating a calendar inside of our Django and React application. This is not the first video in this series. We've already done plenty before in which we've covered an introduction and basic setup, explored different views and displayed our database data on our calendar. And we've also given events different colors based on data and filtered events on our calendar with a multi-select filter and also with some date filters. In this video, we're going to continue and we're going to make sure that we can click the events on our calendar, which will then take us to a page that displays some details about the event. Now to realize this, we're going to be following four steps. We're going to start by making a change to our backend so that we can get data out of our database for one specific event. Next, we're going to create a front end page for details of one specific event. So that page is going to display all of the information of the event that we've clicked on for our calendar. Then we're going to get the data from our backend and display it on that new event page and add a link to our calendar so that we can go to the page through our calendar. And the first thing that we're going to be doing is making sure that we can retrieve a single record based on a primary key from our backend to our frontend. You can see inside of our current view set that we have only a function defined for list, which is going to get all of our appointments and take them to the frontend through the serializer. However, in this example, we want to display the details of a single appointment. And to arrange that, we need to add another function, which allows us to retrieve just one record. And if we go to the documentation of Django REST framework, you can see that when using view sets, there are different actions that we can do to do different things. So we can define multiple functions in one view set that allow us to do the different things, making sure that it's all a little bit more compact than defining different views for different things. So you can see in here that there are a multitude of options available. The dev list one we already have, and that retrieves all of the information that we would like. We also have view sets for creating records, for updating records, for partially updating records, and for deleting records. But what we want to do is retrieve one specific record based on a primary key. And that is exactly what we're going to be adding to our backend now. Now to realize this, we can make a very basic change. We can first of all define a new function and that is going to be called retrieve, similarly as in the documentation. Now retrieve is going to take in a number of parameters. The first one is going to be self so that we can reference the stuff that is up here. Next, we also want to refer to request because we are making requests. And then we want to define pk is equal to none. And we add that because we're going to be using a primary key to retrieve the correct information. Now, next we can define some of the things that retrieve needs to do. So we start off by defining the query set. And in this case, we're going to take a look at self.querySet, set, which is going to reference this one right here. But now we're going to get one specific record and we're going to get that specific record by stating that the primary key is going to be equal to primary key. And what this is going to do is it's going to take the value that we pass alongside the URL and it's going to look up that value inside of the primary key column of our query set, which is going to be the ID field. And later on, I will show you exactly what I mean by that. Next, we also need to define which serializer we want to use to process this request because we need a serializer to make sure that the data from our backend can be read by our frontend. And in there, we can define self.serializer class. And in there, we refer again to the query set because that's the information that needs to be serialized. Now, as a last thing, we can return a response because we want to get something back. And in there, we say that we want to get back the serializer.data. And if we now save this, it should allow us to retrieve one single record based on the information right here. And we actually can leave our serializer and also the URL as is, because by using view sets, we actually make our life a lot easier because it's automatically going to define a URL for all of these different scenarios. So let's now start our server and check out the results in our backend. 
So to start our backend server, we do cd into our backend. And then we're going to do venv slash scripts slash activate to activate our virtual environment. And as a last step, we do python manage.py run server, which will run our backend server. And when we now go to the URL of our backend, you can see that we have the appointments URL specified right here. And if I make a mistake in here, such as going to AAAA, you can actually see that it by default has created appointments URLs for all different kinds of scenarios. So that's quite nice. Now, if we go to the localhost 8000 and click on the appointments like this, you can see that we get a list of all of the appointments that we currently have inside of our database. However, if we now specify a one, it should actually retrieve the information for where our primary key or our ID is equal to one. So it should only give us this record right here. And you can indeed see that it only retrieves the record for which we've put in the ID. So that's working just fine. Now, what we want to do in our front end is we want to create an API request that takes in the ID and based on that is going to retrieve the information. So in our calendar, we will pass in the ID as the parameter. And based on that, we can get the details on the page in our front end. So now that this is actually working, let's go into our front end folder and actually create the pages for where we can display those details. Now, the first thing what we need to create is a component. Uh, so I'm going to add a new file inside of the components folder, and I'm going to be calling that event details.jsx. And in there we can import React from React, and we can then define our constant as constant event details. And then we can do an equal sign, some round brackets, and then an arrow function. And inside of this event details, we can also say that we want to return something because in the end we want to return some information. So we can put in a diff for now that states this is the details page of our application. And as a last step, we can export our default called event details. And that is going to make sure that we can use this in different pages. So now we have created the page where we're going to do all of the magic and show the details, but we still also need to add this to our app.jsx file. So in there, I'm going to import our event details from our components folder. And we're going to create a new route right here that can go into the event details. So as the element, I want to display the event details page. Now, as a path, we can say that we want to go to event details, but we want to also have the primary key in the URL as the parameter, because the primary key is going to determine what page we go to and what API request we are going to give our backend. So next to the event details, I'm going to do a slash and then a colon and then ID like this. And this is going to let the path know that we're expecting a parameter called ID on our event details page. Now let's go to our front end and see what this will look like. So I'm going to open another terminal right here and I'm going to CD into front end and in there do npm run dev. And now inside of our front end server, when we go to slash event details and then one, we get to the details page of our application. Now, what we want to do is we want to get the parameter that is specified into the URL, and we want to use that parameter to retrieve the data from our backend. Because in the end, in our calendar, we're going to go to the details page by including the ID of the appointment. And then once we are in the event details page, we're going to use that ID again to get the right data of that appointment into our page. So let's now pretend that we are looking up this particular item in the backend and we want to display the details on our React.js frontend. 
Now, the first thing what we want to do is extract the one from our URL because we need that and include it into the API request so that we can construct this localhost 8000 slash appointments slash one. So let's do that right now. And we can go to our event details page. And in there, we're going to make an import because what we can do is we can import use params from React Router DOM. Now I've already installed React Router DOM inside of my project. Now, if you don't have this package yet, then you need to install it. And it's literally npm install and then react-router-dom. So that's what you can use to install this package inside of your terminal. Now we already have it. So we can use use params to retrieve the parameter inside of our URL. And we can do that by defining some constants. So first I can define a constant of my param and in there state use params and then some round brackets. Now let's see what that retrieves by doing console.log and then my param. Now back in our React.js frontend, if I now go to inspect and I go to our console, you can see that the use params uh, provides information about the parameters that we have. Now, the only parameter we have set is the one of ID. And you can also see that in our app.jsx because we only have the slash and then the ID. If I would do another slash and I would say name like this, and I would then go back and do slash and I say CBI analytics, it would actually take in now the two parameters. They're specified by the name that we give them in the app, the JSX file. Now, in this case, we can delete the name because we're not interested in that. We only want the one for ID. So if we go to the event details, we can actually get the constant my ID by saying that we're interested in my param dot ID. And if I now log my ID instead of my param, you will notice that we get the one that we need. Now, that is exactly what we're now going to use to be getting the data from our backend into our frontend. Now, to do that, we need to make an API request again by using our Axios instance that we have defined in a couple of videos ago. Now, I'm going to make it myself a little bit easy and copy over the majority of the code from our calendar page because we've actually done this process a couple of times before. So what I'm going to copy over is the constant of loading and set loading, and also the mechanism that gets the data and the use effect hook, which is going to determine how often it gets rendered. Back to our event details, and in here I can paste in that whole thing, but we do need to include the use effect and the use state hooks inside of our imports. So next to React, I'm going to also import the use state and also the use effect. Now we're also going to be using the Axios instance to get this data. So we can also import Axios instance from our Axios instance file. Now, um, this is all related to our previous use case. It's not necessarily relevant right now. So I'm going to delete the set status options and the set selected status. And I'm going to leave the set loading because perhaps we also want to have that, that loading functionality in here. Now, uh, we also want to pass the data to some constants. Uh, and right now it's setting it to set events, but that doesn't exist yet. So I'm going to create another constant right here called events and then set events so that whatever we're going to request right here will end up right here. Now, as a last step, let's also already put in the loading thing in our return statement, like we've also done previously. So we can copy over the loading and the set loading mechanism. And we used this previously to make sure that um, our application is done with loading the data before it actually displays anything in our return statement, which avoids uh, quite some errors for us. And we then need to make sure that whatever the text is going to be needs to be inside of one block. So like this. And just like this, I think we are ready to modify our API. Now, uh, what I already explained previously is that we need to look for slash appointments and then slash one. So in our code right here, we need to add the my ID that we've defined right here to this API request to only get the data for the primary key that we're interested in. 
Now it's very easy to actually do that. We can add the my ID constant in there by doing a dollar sign. And then we can specify some squarely brackets. And in there, we state that we want to include my ID. And this is going to take this value of one into our API request. Then it is going to take that response and populate the events constant with the set events constant right here. And it's also going to set the loading to false so that it knows that it can display this information right here. And it's also going to lock the data that we get into our console. So let's save this for now. And let's check out the console to see what data we're actually getting. So we are now in our event details and we're going to look it up for the key of one, which means that we should get this data right here. So let's reload the page and go to inspect to see what our console returns. And you can see that we have an object here and it indeed is the information from where the ID is equal to one. So we now have this information ready. Now, of course, I want to display some kind of information on the screen. So we can use the events constant right here to display some of the information in blocks on our page. Uh, in here, you can do whatever you want, but I'm just going to keep it quite basic and have some boxes on there with some different information uh, for the user. But of course, you can go as crazy as you would like. So in the top of the screen, we're going to be importing the box from Material Y, which we also used in Calendar 7. So let's put that in right there. And now I'm going to start with defining a first box inside of here. And inside of that box, we can display some information. So let's also split this box up. And we're going to get two more boxes defined below the top box and i'm going to do it in the key value pairs so in here let's say that i want to get the data for name um, and i'm going to say that what we want to see here is the title of the event so we're going to put some squarely brackets in and then refer to event dot title and if we go to our api that refers to this value right here it should get us appointment one in text and it actually needs to be events.title, not event.title. Now, when I save this, it should print the title on that page. And you can see that we now have a name and a appointment, but it doesn't look that great. So let's format it a little bit so that we have a little bit of a nicer UI. So to do that uh, very easily, I can do SX and then an IS and then two square brackets to just quickly apply some styling props. You can also use class names and then do it with CSS, which is probably a little bit uh, better in this case, but this is just to show you what is possible. So in here, I'm gonna do box shadow, and I'm going to set that to free, which is going to add some styling around the edges like this. Now, what I also want to do is give it some space from the edge, so we can go and add some padding in there as well. And let's set that to 20 pixels. So it has a little bit more space around it like that. Then I also would like these items to actually be next to each other instead of underneath each other. So we're going to add a display of flex. And then we can say that the flex direction of the items can be equal to row. And then we need to make sure that this one right here is actually a comma and not a dot. And you can now see that we have them next to each other like this. Now, uh, of course, this is also quite close to each other. So what we can do to make this look a little bit more separated is also add some styling things on these boxes on the bottom. So I can say here, for example, for the name that I want the font weight to be equal to bold. And that should make sure that it pops a little bit more than before. And then we can also copy over this styling element for the title and then replace this one and say that we want to have a margin on the left to make sure it's a little bit further away from the name. And we can say that it needs a margin of 10. And now it is a little bit more spaced out evenly. Then we can also make sure that when we create more boxes, they're not that close uh, up to each other. So on the 
top box, I'm going to give it a margin bottom. And I can set that to 20 pixels like this. And that should make sure that we, uh, we have nice looking boxes right there. Now I'm just going to copy over this particular box a few times. Now I know this doesn't really fit into the reusability side of things because we define these things over and over. So ideally you would create an additional component for these type of boxes, or you would just use a class name to do all of this styling on the boxes. But for now, it doesn't matter uh, that much. Now, what I also want to display in terms of information is the status. And that one is actually inside of the class names field right here. So in here, we can define that we want to see events dot class names. And then I also want to show the start date. So we can say that start date is going to be equal to events dot start. And let's also include the end date in there. So we can say that it's equal to event dot end. And let's save that. And now when we go back to our front end, you can see that we have four boxes which display a little bit more information about the uh, appointment of our calendar. Now, to make this all complete, we actually need to make sure that when we click something on our calendar, it goes to that event details page and looks up the data based on the ID that we uh, included inside of the event. Now, to do that, we need to make a change to our calendar itself. So to change that, we need to go to our calendars and then to my calendar seven, because that's where I have the code for the full calendar. And the first thing that we need to figure out is how we can actually make sure that we get to that page. Now, if we go to the fullcalendar.io website and we go to the documentation, then we can scroll down a little bit until we hit the events. And one of the items is clicking and hovering over the events. So in here, you can see that we have a number of parameters that we can use to do different actions. And one of them is event click. And that is going to trigger something when the user clicks on an event. And that is what I want to use to make it go to the event details page. Now, if we go to the event click section right here, you can see that we can define a function that does a certain thing. And in this case, we're going to configure this in a way that it goes to the URL where we want to go to. So we're gonna go to the calendar seven page right here, and we're going to create a constant that is going to do the action of the clicking. So in here, I define the constant of event click action. And in there, we can say that we want to get information from event and then do an arrow function and then some squirrely records to do the navigation to a different page. Now, to navigate to a different page, we're actually going to use another hook from the React Router DOM package. And we're going to be importing the use navigate from React Router DOM. Now, to use use navigate, we can define a constant called navigate. And in there, we state that we want to have use navigate for when we mention navigate. Now, inside of our event click action, we can then specify what we want to do when an event is being clicked. And what we actually want to do is navigate to a certain page. And to do that, we only need to define the URL that we need to go to. Now, in here, we need to define a few things. First, we'll do some backwards commas like this, similar to when we uh, define the APIs. And if we go to the front end, you can see that we first want to go to event details and then do slash and then the ID. Now, to realize this inside of this statement, we can do slash event details, and that is automatically going to fix the part before it that goes to the localhost 5173. Now, after this, we do a slash and we want to include the ID of the event from full calendar inside of this link. Now, we can do that by specifying the dollar sign again and then some squarely brackets. And in there, do event.event.id. And actually, let's call this one data. And then we can change it to data.event.id. That looks a little bit uh, better. So what this will do, it will take a look at the event parameter from the full calendar and take the field called ID to use inside of this link. Now, we actually now need to trigger this particular function 
And that's where we can go and use the event click. So I'm gonna go to the full calendar part of the code and in there state that event click is going to be equal to event click action. And now every time we click an event, it will navigate to the event details page and then to the ID that we've specified inside of the function. So let's save this and see if it actually works. So we are now back inside of our calendar seven and now it should be the case that when we click this appointment right here, it is going to take us to the next page. So let's click it and you can indeed see that we now get the data for appointment free, open a start date and an end date. So it seems to be working just fine. And now the whole circle is actually complete because when we click on a certain event, it is going to take the ID inside of this URL right here. We then extract this ID, look up the information in the newly written API and retrieve and display all of the information that we want. And that is the way that we can display some details and go to another page while clicking the events. And the last thing that I want to add to this is a change the way that our cursor looks when we hover over the event. Because right now there's nothing that indicates that this is clickable. So what I want to do is that when we uh, are hovering over the uh, event right here, that the cursor changes so that it gives an indication of that it is clickable. Now to do that, it is actually really easy. If we go to inspect and then inspect the event itself, you can see that in the top level of the event right here, it mentions that the class name of this complete event is fc-event like this. And you can also see when we go to another one right here, it is going to be the same. So all events have the same class name. Now to change the cursor based on the class name FC event is actually really easy because we can go to our application code and then to the app.css. And in there we can state that we want to format the .fc event. And then we do some square brackets like this. And then we can define that the cursor needs to be equal to a pointer. And because our app.css is being applied right here on our app.jsx, it should automatically format the class name called FC event and make sure that it looks a little bit different. And now that we are back, you can see that if I hover over the event, it actually turns into a pointer instead to the regular cursor that we have right here. And now it's a little bit easier to see that this thing is actually clickable. And that is actually all that we're going to be doing for today. In this video, I showed you how you can add links to your events and go to a page where it displays the details. In the next video, we're going to continue and I'm going to show you how we can add an event to the calendar by just clicking the cell. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.